Welcome back to Paul's Tech News. This week's theme is balance, because as we slog through the weapons-grade heat waves that summer 2022 has already thrust upon us, it's good to consider that in time, the seasons will change and we will transition back to being uncomfortably cold instead. And so the cycle continues, much like the tech news. Hot and cold, good and bad, arousal and flaccidity, it's all part of the natural balance of things. So it is fitting that I have positive news to share today like PC hardware getting less expensive, and not just GPUs either. Next-gen NVIDIA cards with faster clocks are coming, and Intel has good news about Raptor Lake memory compatibility too. And sure, there's bad news as well, but I grouped it all into a short part towards the end so we can get through it quick, like peeling off a Band-Aid. So if you've been feeling off balance lately, allow me to offer you something solid to get a good grip on and steady yourself. I'm referring, of course, to this week's tech news. Excellent. Today's video is brought to you by the Corsair K70 RGB Pro Mechanical Gaming Keyboard, powered by Axon Processing Technology and Genuine Cherry MX Mechanical Switches. This board packs its aluminum frame with features like dynamic per-key RGB lighting, a detachable USB Type-C cable, durable PBT double-shot keycaps, and IQ software support on both PC and Mac OS. You also get dedicated media keys, a multi-function volume roller, onboard storage for up to 50 profiles and more. So for further details on the Corsair K70 RGB Pro, click the sponsor link in the video description. Let us begin this week with the continuation of one of the best and happiest trends of 2022. GPU prices just keep dropping. Perhaps not as precipitously as in the first half of the year, but Tom's Hardware says we are down 57% since January, with another 14% decline now in the books for June. Used GPU prices in particular are putting pressure on retail sales, as it appears that more and more GPU mining operations are opting to liquidate their hardware due to limited or negative mining profitability. This seems to have notably affected the secondary market for previous gen cards like the Radeon 5000 series and GeForce 20 series. For example, the RX 5700 XT's average eBay price dropped more than 30% from around $450 down to $314. NVIDIA cards in this range are also down 15 to 20 percent, such as the 1660 Ti that dropped from around 250 down to 200. As for current gen cards, there are plenty of better deals to be had as well. I will say that it would be nice if some of those mid-range NVIDIA holdouts would come down to at least MSRP level as well, like the 3060 Ti, which would be totally awesome for its MSRP of $400. It was 580 and now it's down to 461. That's the average eBay price. The lowest eBay price is about 433, and it has come down at retail a little bit to 470, although again, MSRP should be 400 bucks or less. But at least we can at last buy an RTX 3080 for very close to the MSRP of $700. It is currently 707 if you're okay with a second-hand card from eBay. And this is all theoretically before the true flood has actually begun, if you believe the rumors. And while Ethereum hash rates have been falling since early June, there is still a lot of mining cards out there to make up the hash rate that still exists. So whether it's caused by a continued downward trend in mining profitability, or the merge actually happening and transitioning the whole Ethereum network to proof of stake, which would kill off ETH GPU mining entirely, an actual large-scale sell-off of the hardware that's currently still mining could create market conditions unlike anything we've seen in the tech space before. Probably not the best time for AMD and Nvidia to launch new GPU lineups, but they made their bed, so I guess they get to lie in it. So keep those fingers crossed, PC gaming friends, as our time may soon be at hand. But wouldn't it be cool if the prices of other PC parts went down too? Well, more good news, as that seems like it will be the case with DRAM prices in the second half of this year. According to a report by Trendforce, rapidly declining consumer demand means DRAM prices will be cut by anywhere from 3 to 10 percent, hopefully just in time for Intel's Raptor Lake and AMD's Zen 4 CPUs to launch, so maybe there will be reasonably priced DDR5 options. A word of warning, though, we should remain somewhat wary of market trends that pressure manufacturers to cut prices because they can opt to limit production when they forecast limited demand for their products. This is also reflected in a trend force report published Thursday, which refers to a wave of order cancellations with chip foundries affecting the books for the second half of 2022. And while this currently only affects older process nodes and not the leading edge fabs where our coveted CPU and GPU dies are etched, there is the potential for dim sales prospects to lead even AMD 
and NVIDIA to scale back their orders for next-gen parts. For now, Tom's Hardware says there is no evidence of Radeon RX 7000 GPU family, of Ryzen 7000 CPU family, or of GeForce RTX 40 GPU family production cuts. And let's hope that doesn't change, even though we are all secretly hoping that they ultimately lose money by making way too many of those next-gen graphics cards. Speaking of next-gen GPUs that NVIDIA should definitely still make as many as possible of, the RTX 4090 will likely be the ultimate or penultimate skew in the ADA GPU-based stack expected towards the end of this year. And according to that indefatigable Twitter rumor monger Copite7Kimi, it is now rumored to run at a blistering 2520 megahertz boost clock nearly 50% more clocks than the previous gen RTX 3090. And even further, the actual clock or estimated in-game frequency could be 2,750 megahertz, which is pretty speedy considering the rumored 16,384 CUDA core configuration, which if true, would put the 4090's raw single precision compute performance in the 90 teraflop range, or twice as terafloppy as the RTX 3090 non-TI. Further rumored specs and estimated launch windows for the RTX 4090, 4080, and 4070 are listed in this pleasingly formatted chart from the possibly sentient AI hive mind that controls videocards.com. And wouldn't it be cool if despite these drool-worthy specs, no one wants to buy any of them because stacks and stacks of used RTX 3080s are for sale on eBay for like 20 bucks each. We can dream, right? Speaking of dreaming, I have a dream that Intel will one day make decisions that consumers feel good about. And perhaps you should pinch me because here is one. Intel 13th Gen Core Raptor Lake S CPUs will officially support DDR5 5600 and DDR4 3200 memory. DDR4 and DDR5, not just DDR5 as some had suspected. This was revealed at a workshop presentation held by Intel in Shenzhen, China on Tuesday. So beyond the base speed boost for DDR5, 5600 speed with Raptor Lake versus 4800 speed with Alder Lake, there is a small but potentially very happy group who Intel has done right by here and that's Alder Lake early adopters who are interested in a CPU upgrade when Raptor Lake launches. Alder Lake introduced the DDR5 memory standard, yes, but many reviewers, myself included, proceeded to tell everyone who wanted to build an Alder Lake PC that they should skip DDR5 and stick with DDR4 because it was much more cost effective and DDR5 didn't offer significant performance improvements. But memory standard support for Alder Lake is determined by the motherboard. So if you bought a DDR4 board for your Alder Lake i5-12400 and then wanted to upgrade to something like a Raptor Lake i7-13700K, but the 13700K only supported DDR5, then you'd be in familiar but uncomfortable territory for Intel builders. You'd need to upgrade your motherboard too. But no, says Intel, you can use DDR4 with Raptor Lake, and maybe it was a specific choice, or maybe it was just a sensible engineering decision, but either way, that niche group of users thanks you, Intel, and I extend a nod of appreciation based on the principle of the whole thing. Our last bit of good news comes from Apple, who introduced a new feature for iOS, iPad OS, and Mac OS called Lockdown Mode on Wednesday. This is a feature that most users won't need because it will actually degrade your smartphone using experience in favor of hardening your device against malware and other advanced security threats. Typical smartphone security is fine for the typical user, but if you're the potential target of an organized crime group or a nation state, you'll probably want additional protection for your device. So think diplomats, political dissidents, unfortunate victims of tragedy or other world events who are thrust into the global spotlight. These individuals need some way to combat being specifically targeted by the most sophisticated digital threats or mercenary spyware that bad actors might use against them. Lockdown mode disables things like message attachments, JavaScript and other web browsing technologies, Apple service requests for things like FaceTime, and even wired connections to a computer or a USB device, all of which are common attack points for this type of targeted intrusion. It's likely that Google will follow suit with a similar lockdown mode of its own, which I think is a good thing for personal security and privacy, regardless of what kind of smartphone you use. Speaking of hardening your devices, it's time for a special edition of Tech Briefs, Naughty Tech Briefs, where the bad news flies by so fast you barely even have time to get offended. I've spoken at length in previous Tech News episodes about the refreshing amount of investment going on in new fabs this year, 
from Intel to TSMC to global foundries, but it seems that domestic buildouts here in the US are now at risk because the CHIPS Act, which offers 52 billion US dollars in subsidies for chip makers building factories, has stalled in Congress. As a result, Intel has indefinitely postponed groundbreaking on their $20 billion facility in Ohio. Global Foundries is being dubious about their $1 billion fab set to be built in upstate New York. And although TSMC has started construction on their $12 billion chip plant in Arizona, they say the speed of construction will depend on US subsidies. Are chip makers just being dumb here? Should this CHIPS Act even exist? I'm sure you guys can all sort that out in the comment section down below. But for now, we just need the United States Congress to actually do something before their August recess if we want these fab developments to move forward. So I'm sure everything will be fine. Continuing with the horrible news, picture this. You're an exorbitantly wealthy human thanks to your cryptocurrency investments, and you want a timepiece to adorn yourself with to broadcast your extreme opulence and good taste to anyone you might encounter. But then, crypto markets crash, your portfolio of NFTs plummets in value, and suddenly you are forced to cancel your order for that Rolex Daytona or Patek Philippe Nautilus you've had your eye on. Truly a tragedy for our time, and apparently a tale of woe that has taken place many times over if this Bloomberg article is accurate. Secondhand sales for these extremely pricey wrist clocks are falling, meaning crypto bros who have taken L's in the recent bear market might have to perform an even more degrading act in the future, looking at their phone to see what time it is. But perhaps all is not lost for our affluent friends, as Starlink has announced a great new deal for those interested in high-speed internet for their huge yacht, or maybe even just a medium-sized yacht if you're just in the upper middle class. For just $5,000 a month, you could get Starlink Maritime Service, with download speeds of up to 350 megabits per second from the satellite internet service company, a big discount over the $150,000 a month that Elon Musk says SpaceX was paying for internet on their landing pad barges. Hey Elon, do those barges come with anchors? Because I'm pretty sure that's what you just did there. Anchoring, he's, he's anchoring. Anyway, the service is more practically aimed at oil rigs and the like, but I'm sure there are plenty of rich people who won't bat an eye at paying more for their yacht's internet than most people pay for their mortgage. Bon voyage. Oh, there is one last thing though, and I'm a little late on this, I hope you'll forgive me, but Intel has finally shipped a long-awaited product. No, not ARC desktop GPUs in any meaningful way, but their AXG block scale ASIC for Bitcoin mining. That's right, just in time for Bitcoin to have lost two-thirds of its value over the past eight months, Intel's dedicated application-specific integrated circuit for Bitcoin mining has debuted. And sure, you could criticize Intel for even bothering to invest time and resources to develop this product, but before you do that, consider this. Intel has struggled to bring a range of products to market in recent years, from 10 nanometer CPUs to ARC GPUs, with delay after delay and continually mounting frustration from fans and investors, but for their block scale ASIC, they were actually early, shipping the first units at the end of Q2 instead of in Q3 as initially predicted. So. Way to go, Intel. This sure is a good indication of where your priorities currently lie. But my next priority is to close out this video in a timely fashion, so there you have it, guys. Tech news for the week. And if you liked it, click that like button or leave me a comment down below. While you're down there, all the articles I talked about today are linked in the description if you're interested. And check out my store at paulshardware.net for high-quality merchandise, t-shirts, hoodies, beer sets, and more. Subscribing to my channel is always a good call, too. Thanks again, everyone, and we'll see you next week.